So again, the ARC's mission is to promote and protect the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and actively support their full inclusion in the community. Um, the ARC of Northern Virginia is one of over 600 chapters throughout the United States. Each ARC runs a little bit differently. Um, our ARC, uh, the ARC of Northern Virginia, specifically um, uh, does advocacy and education programs. So the trust program is, is really the only true program that we have at the ARC of Northern Virginia, um, but we also have DD support coordination services, advocacy services, um, transition services. So for folks who are kind of anywhere on the, the spectrum of transitioning um, through uh, early childhood all the way to, you know, um, late uh, adult life. Um, how we're funded. So most of our funding um, is through direct services that we provide, but we're largely supported by memberships, um, dues and donations. Um, so I think I put information in here. Yep, about ways to support. So upcoming, um, in November, we will be celebrating 60 years. Um, so if you're interested in joining us for our 60 year gala, that will be in November, November 5th um, at the Hilton McLean in Tyson's Corner. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so the Special Needs Trust Program specifically um, has been operating since 1999. So we have over 22 years of experience in setting up and managing special needs trusts. Um, although we are the ARC of Northern Virginia, we also work with uh, folks who live in Maryland and DC. So we serve all three, um, uh, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Um, and again, we are one of uh, 666 chapters. So there's 11 chapters in Maryland, 24 in Virginia, and one in DC. So if there's any information presented today, that's we really are gonna be more uh, talking about Virginia. But if you want information and you live in uh, Maryland and DC, we can help get you connected to the right organizations and people um, to talk about that as well. Uh, this is our trust team. So again, that's Tia Marsili, who's our director of trust. And then we have Evelyn Gu, who is our assistant director. There's me. Um, Ali Shelby, who's on the call as well this morning, is our director of first impressions. Trini uh, is our account manager. Hani and Fiona are both of our account coordinators. And then Rob Hudson is also on the call this morning, is our communications associate, helping keep me on track this morning. Um, and then this is also uh, our trust team here. Key Bank is our trustee. So if you establish a trust with the ARC of Northern Virginia, Key Private Bank is the trustee. Um, and then the foundation of the ARC of Northern Virginia is, the, um, is our oversight foundation. So they, they review everything and, and oversee the trust program ultimately. So there's some of our foundation members. And then if you are interested in learning more about special needs trusts or wish to set one up, you can always contact us or the easiest way really now is to go to our website to schedule an appointment. We offer free 50 minute consultations. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, please visit our website and you can schedule um, a, a, a consultation. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that now. And before we get to um, our panelists, I want to go ahead and run some polls so that we can kind of gauge where everyone is at this morning. We can learn a little bit about you all, uh, kind of where your knowledge base is, um, and that will help us tailor. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the polls. Oh, uh, Rob, for some reason, it's telling me I'm not able to do that. Are you able to launch the polls on your end? Uh, let me see here. Are you seeing it now? No, I'm I hit not. launch. It is not letting me launch them. We're seeing it as a presenter, so it's up. It's just not. Oh, you are. Okay. For we some are. Not All because we're hosting, maybe? Does everybody okay. else? Someone else? Well, Rob, if you can run that on your end and we can get folks to answer those polls. Is everyone able to see it? I'm able to see it. I am too. Okay. 
All right, great. Well, let's go ahead and, and run those. Rob, if you can run them for some reason, I just can't see it. Yeah, it says it's up, so. Well, there we go. Can you go ahead and, and ask the question? I can't see it at all for some reason. Okay. Um, Two people question. have answered, but mine is not letting me answer, but it is showing that people have been able Yeah, to we are getting a few it. here. Let me see. Yeah, we've gotten about eight answers so far, 10. So people are answering. Okay. Yeah, I can run through these really quickly. Uh, question number Please. one is, where are you from? Um, our choices are Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland. Uh, we do also have a choice for other if you're coming from elsewhere. Um, question number two, what is the age of the person with disabilities for whom you are advocating? And we have age groups 0 to 18, 19 to 30, 31 to 40, and 41 or older. Um, how immediate is your need for your child's housing? We have immediate within one year, uh, two to five years, six or more years, and then never, if you feel like that's, that's not going to be an option for you. Uh, number four, can your child's needs, such as medical, logistical, or emotional, be met outside the home? Uh, question number five, in your discussions at home, um, oh, it moved. It, it moved while I was looking at it. Um, in your discussions at home, has your child expressed interest in living independently with supports? Um, number six, what do you think is the biggest hurdle to your child living away from home? Um, as a parent, I, I, I looked at this list with a, with a little bit of dread. Uh, housing availability, housing affordability. Uh, medical support, emotional and behavioral support, uh, logistical support, uh, my anxiety, which is big, um, and other. Uh, question number seven, if you are considering supported independent housing for your child, what type of living arrangement are you interested in? And on this one, you can actually choose as many as you think apply. Um, apartment, house, supported living facility, or if you're undecided, and um, the last question, would you be interested in your child living alone or with someone else? This was also a multiple choice if you want to um, choose as many as apply. Um, alone, uh, with a roommate, with support professional staff, or if you're undecided on that one as well. So those are all our questions. All right, did we get everyone's questions answered or the polls run through? It says 100%. Great, awesome. I wish I could see those. Um, Rob, are you able to launch the results? Uh, um, it says end poll. Are we ready to do that? Yes, please. Okay. If, if most people have answered, yeah. It uh, looks like we're still getting a few. Okay. Or if... So we have 50 participants, we have 42. Okay, that's, that's fine, that's most. Okay, I'll go ahead and end the poll. Now, are you able to see the results? I'm not, I'm not sure why. I see them. Okay. And you're up to 82% participated. It looks like most of us, except for Ashley, all the panelists can see it. And then some of the participants message that they can see it. Oh. Well, thank you everyone for, for responding to those. Um, like I said, at the end of this presentation, we'll be, we will be sharing um, not only this presentation, which is recorded, but we'll also be sharing the slide decks from our panelists and we'll post all of those um, responses to the questions and, and it, of course, any questions that you have in the chat. So thank you all for responding to those. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping um, before we start with our panelists. If you have questions while they're presenting, please post them in the chat. 
Um, we we want to let our panelists do their presentations first, um, uninterrupted, and then we will save the Q and A session for the very end um, of our time today. So please go ahead and pop those in the chat and make sure that you stay on mute while our panelists are presenting. Um, all right, so this morning, I'm going to start with uh, and introduce um, Jeannie Cummins Eisenhower, who is, um, as I said, the, the regional director at DBHDS of, of housing. So Jeannie, welcome. Um, you should be able to go ahead and, and run your slides, um, but let me know if you have any issues. I also have them. All right, give me just a second here and we'll make them go. All right, can you see that? Yes, we can, thank you. Awesome, all right. So my name's Jeannie Cummins. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I am I'm not a director, I'm the regional housing coordinator. <laughs> so um, can I can answer a lot of questions, but can't make a ton of decisions. So how, how does that sound for, for a, a, a position title? Um, uh, but I do work up here in the Northern Virginia area, and I uh, help both develop housing assistance resources and get individuals and their families and uh, others connected to those resources to make sure that folks get to transition to independent housing. So I'm going to walk you through today uh, a little bit about what we mean by independent housing, what who who's eligible for the resources that uh, the Office of Community Housing makes available statewide. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what those resources, each of those resources does. So um, to start with, uh, when we talk about independent housing, um, we're really talking about housing that is very similar to what you or I may live in. It's mostly gonna be rental housing um, for the purposes of this conversation, but it's housing where people have a lease with a, with a housing provider. Um, they, uh, their uh, ability to remain in their housing is not uh, conditioned upon receiving certain sorts, certain types or amounts of support. It's, those supports are basically arranged separately, but hopefully in conjunction with the housing. Um, and individuals uh, basically have uh, access to affordable housing. So I saw that was one of the polling questions and one of those sort of you know, concerns about being able to, to uh, get into housing. With all of our housing programs, the housing has to be made affordable. And we do that through a number of different mechanisms. And we'll talk about those today. But really the, the idea here is, is that the person is contr in control of their own housing. They have tenancy rights. Um, People can't just, you know, say we're discharging you from your housing. There, there's actual court processes and protections that legal protections people have to be able to remain in their housing as long as they are following the rules of their lease and um, and the rules of the, the different programs that we're talking about. So who's in this population that is eligible for the resources? So it we're going to mostly be talking about resources today that are for adults with developmental disabilities who are age 18 or older, and they are in one of each of the following categories. Um, the first category is living in a training center, intermediate care or nursing facility, and the person meets the level of support or functioning for to qualify for one of the developmental disabilities waivers. Um, and this, the, the next category is if a person receives services from a Medicaid developmental disabilities waiver, um, and I've listed some of those services here. And the third category is the person is on a wait list for the Medicaid developmental disabilities waiver. Um, so if, you, if a person is 18 or older, has a diagnosed developmental disability, and is in one of any of these three categories, they would be eligible for housing resources. They're in our target population. So let's talk about those housing resources. So, um, and, and let me back up just to say, just to make sure that everybody's level set about that waiver thing. Um, the Medicaid waiver, if you're not familiar with it, is long-term care insurance for services that are in the person's home or in the community. Um, for a person with developmental disabilities. 
So it's basically a long-term care insurance program for people who are um, low income and have a developmental disability and need services in their home and community to be able to you know, live independently and safely and healthily. So that's what the waiver is. What you're waiving is care in an institutional placement. So Medicaid is required by law to provide care in an institutional placement um, and, if, and pay for it if a person is income and diagnostically eligible. They're not required to provide such services in the home and community, but Medicaid has a program where it shares money with the federal uh, government to be able to pay for home and community services. Unfortunately, it's, it's something the state can opt into and it doesn't necessarily opt in to provide services to everyone, hence the wait list. So that's why we've uh, added the criteria of either having a waiver or being eligible for the waiver and on a wait list. So um, let's talk about these resources. So we have several different housing resources available for people who are that waiver eligible or getting that DD waiver. Um, there's the state rental assistance program, which is a rent subsidy program where people get uh, uh, essentially financial assistance to help pay their rent to make it affordable. There's the low income housing tax credit program, which makes uh, is a basically a source of financing where the developer gets equity from tax credits um, in exchange for making or producing or constructing housing that is affordable to people in certain income ranges. Then there's flexible funding, which is a, a program that helps individuals overcome uh, barriers, financial barriers to getting, making that initial transition into housing and or uh, financial barriers that may prevent them from maintaining their housing. And the last one is our community housing guide service through the waiver and our tenancy supports program, which is helps people, these two resources help individuals on the waiver or on the waiver wait list um, make the transition into housing by, uh, and we'll discuss sort of what they, what they do in just a moment. So let's dive into the state rental assistance program. We, uh, our agency started the state rental assistance program back in October of 2016. At that time, it was only offered in four areas of the state. Um, including Fairfax, Norfolk, Chesapeake, and Virginia Beach. The goal, uh, and it's expanded substantially since then, the goal of this program, again, is to help people have an opportunity to move from these uh, more institutional-like settings, group homes, and or their own family's home to market rental housing that's available in the community. Um, this rent subsidy or financial assistance provides what we call either tenant-based or project-based rent assistance. Tenant-based rent assistance basically means you get a voucher or a, a certificate that uh, verifies you're eligible for the rent assistance and you take it to any landlord in the community. And um, you can rent there up to, uh, and that, that, that certificate provides assistance up to a maximum limit that's based on the, the, the household size. So, uh, that's tenant-based assistance. And, and you can, so for example, in Fairfax County, Fairfax and Falls Church cities, you can take that certificate to any landlord in those areas um, uh, and, and be able to rent there as long as, you know, uh, within, with a maximum subsidy amount. Project-based rent assistance means that rather than getting a, um, a, a, a certificate that you're gonna be able to take anywhere in the community, you get a certificate that is going to have a rent assistance attached to a specific property with a specific unit that gets the assistance. So if you decide later on, after you've leased for, for uh, you know, a little while, that you want to move somewhere else, you can't take that rent assistance with you. It stays with the property and that unit for the next person who may be eligible for it. So that's the difference between tenant and project-based rent assistance. So I've uh, so and in the SREP program, a person or a household is generally going to pay about thirty to forty percent of their monthly adjusted income toward the rent and utilities that are tenant paid, and the subsidy will pay the difference up to a maximum amount based on the bedroom size that's been approved for that household. Um, I can't give you details on that subsidy amount because it changes every year, 
depends on where the, the unit is located and a number of different factors, but that's essentially how it works. So this chart here basically just gives you a, a quick summary of the total kinds of SRAP subsidies that are available in the uh, local jurisdictions here in Northern Virginia, um, or the total subsidies that the program has in each area. And then a, a little quick status report on how many we still have available to be used, um, both on the tenant-based subsidy side and the project-based subsidy side. And you'll see how in the project-based subsidy side in Fairfax County, Fairfax City of Falls Church, we have uh, the project-based subsidies attached to a specific unit. In this case, a one, uh, a one bedroom a unit that's uh, fully accessible, that's in the Arrowbrook apartment property in Herndon, and one two bedroom unit that is fully accessible at the Arden, which is a property located in the Huntington area of Fairfax County. So that's the rent subsidy portion of this. Now, let's talk about the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Again, this is a program that provides special equity financing to developers that are developing housing that is affordable to low and moderate income households. When uh, in a tax credit property, the rents are set for, uh, for households that are in certain income ranges. So, um, and it's based on a percentage of area median income. So you may be in the 50 per to 60 percent of area median income, you may be in the 40 to 50 percent of area median income your household is, depending on what that number is for, for those uh, uh, percentages of area median income. Here's an example. Um, a 50% uh, of area median income for a single person household in our area is, is around $40,000 or so. So um, the rents get set at 30% of that monthly income level. So that, that's what, uh, what, what's targeted for people to pay. Now, even though, even then, the rents can still be higher than what a single person on, for example, a fixed income like supplemental security income could afford without rent assistance. So that's why we encourage people to look at when they get state rental assistance, they then look uh, at these tax credit properties because those rents are generally within the maximum limit for the rent assistance. Um, and, and these properties typically will accept uh, are, and are very used to working with people who have rent assistance. In addition, some tax credit properties have a preference for people with developmental disabilities who are settlement agreement applicants, meaning they have a waiver or on that waiver wait list. So those properties that have a preference means that when a person with a developmental disability applies to one of their units, their application for that unit is considered first ahead of everybody else in line who is applying for that unit. So again, renters um, can use SRAP or they can use uh, another source of rent subsidy that our, our agency doesn't offer in this area, but it's called the housing choice voucher um, to subsidize the rent. And they those, those, again, both rent subsidies would be able to be used in tax credit properties. Also good to know about some tax credit properties, some properties, um, actually have units that all also come with a, a type of rent assistance. It's usually, um, uh, rather than project-based state rental assistance, it's a project-based housing choice voucher. So it's important to ask about those as well. So this is just a quick overview of um, tax credit properties in Northern Virginia that have units with leasing preferences coming available in 2022. So we mentioned the Arden before, because that has a, 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 a project-based accessible unit with SRAP. Um, the Cadence is in Arlington. Loudoun is in, uh, Loudoun View Senior is for seniors in Loudoun County. You have to be 62 or older to rent there. Ovation at Arrowbrook is in the Herndon area. Terwilliger Place in Arlington. And the Waypoint in the city of Alexandria. So this chart just tells you how many leasing preference slots they have for uh, the target population, and then how many right now are still available, how many of these slots are still available. Um, so, uh, and it, because it's a slot and not a specific unit, those slots can only be available 
based on whatever units they have, unit configurations they have left in the property. So for example, some of these properties are, are leasing now or pre-leasing and going to be leasing very soon. And they've already assigned many units. So for example, at the Arden, the only size unit they have still available are two bedrooms. Um, same with the Waypoint, for example. All right, and then this last column just tells you when they anticipate based on their construction schedules, the first people will move in. So this gives you a feel for, for that. So a quick overview of the housing process. So how does it work to get access to these resources we've talked about so far? Well, you start by uh, having your CSB or CSB contracted support coordinator. So sometimes like the ARC is a support coordinator for some people. Um, submit a housing referral, a DBHDS housing referral. Um, my office, the Department of Behavioral Health, uh, is going to confirm using the information on that referral that the person is in the target population. And we're gonna work with the support coordinator, their family and individual to prep that referral to make sure that that person has everything that they're going to need to have in place to successfully rent, uh, be eligible for and use rent assistance, be eligible and for and use a tax credit unit and get into housing and successfully lease housing. So we are gonna work with folks on things like making sure that they have the supports in place they're gonna need to maintain their housing and follow the rules of their lease and the rent assistance program. Make sure that they have a budget that was going to work in housing, even if they have a rent subsidy. Make sure that they have all of the documentation they're going to need to be able to get through the application processes. Things like birth certificate, social security card, photo ID, latest benefit letter from SSI or DI or latest pay stubs, bank statements, things like that. Um, assuming the folks have all those things in place, and we're also gonna talk with them about any barriers or stumbling blocks they may uh, encounter or have. So things like they don't have uh, good credit, they have debts owed, things like that. If there's a criminal history, those, those things can make it difficult to get into housing. We'll talk through how we're going to work uh, through those issues to be able to help people successfully transition. Once we've prepped that referral, we're gonna assign it to a rent assistance program like the state rental assistance program if the person needs rental assistance to afford housing. And then the individual is going to actually apply for that rent assistance. After the individual applies um, and is uh, approved for the rent assistance, then we're, if the person wants to lease in a tax credit property, we're going to assign their referral to a tax credit property that has a leasing preference. And we're gonna give them a letter that says they are eligible for this leasing preference. The individual will then apply to the rental property with their target population letter and their rental assistance certificate. And if they're approved to rent at the, by the property, then the rent assistance program is gonna make sure that the unit meets the requirements uh, to be approved for the subsidy. So we're, the program's gonna look at whether the rent is reasonable compared to other units, similar units in the community. And we're gonna look to make sure that it's affordable even with the rent subsidy, meaning that that person should pay no more than 40% of their monthly income toward the rent. If there's additional money needed to be able to cover the rent, then the unit's not affordable and it won't get approved. Last but not least, we're going to look at uh, health and safety. So the unit's gonna be inspected and make sure that it meets some very basic sort of uh, uh, general safety requirements. Assuming that the unit is approved for the rent subsidy, then the individual will sign a lease and move in. So the last resource I wanna cover is flexible funding. Um, and again, flexible funding is really a, a pot of, of uh, or an allocation of, of funds for people in that target population to help them overcome financial barriers to making their initial transition to independent housing. So it will cover things, uh, the person has access to up to $5,000 as needed to cover things like um, security and utility deposits, I should take application fee out, that, that's no longer the truth. <laughs> so security and utility deposits, first month's rent, some very basic essential startup furniture and household supplies, and sometimes some assistive technology or modifications to the housing that's needed, but isn't covered by another resource like the waiver. How do you get access to this pot of money? 
you have to again go through the DD support coordinator um, with the CSB or CSB contracted agency. So for more details, we don't have a lot of time, but for more details about how this program works, I've given you a website. You can read the guidelines, figure out what's covered and what's uh, not. And it talks about how the, the process for approval and um, either reimbursement or payment uh, for these things uh, occurs. And last but not least, there's a service to help you navigate some of these housing issues called Community Housing Guide and the Tenancy Supports Pilot. So the Community Housing Guide is a waiver service. So if you have any of the DD waivers, this service is available under those waivers. Um, if you are on the waiver wait list, you can access the Tenancy Supports Pilot. So when people transition to housing, they often need some help to figure out what their housing needs and preferences and barriers are, and then develop and implement a plan to secure housing, including creating that budget we talked all about, securing a housemate or a live-in aid uh, to live with the person, how to apply for rent assistance, search for housing that has uh, with your rent assistance, apply for the housing, how to arrange your move and set up utilities and renter's insurance, get your furniture and household supplies, and learn how to get around and use your new apartment. And then last but not least, make sure you understand the rules that you have to follow with rent, uh, under rent assistance and with a lease. So again, um, people on the waiver can use the Community Housing Guide waiver service to help with all of these things. People on the waiver wait list in Northern Virginia can use the Tenancy Supports Program. Um, at no cost to help with these same things. And last but not least, once again, you contact your support coordinator for a referral. That's gonna be your central entry point into all things housing. And that's what I've got. So I'll turn it back to you, Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeannie. That was really informative. Um, and I appreciate your flexibility and time this morning. Um, I will turn it over now to Donna Budway um, from Our Stomping Grounds, and she will share a little bit about her organization. So take it away, Donna. Great, thank you so much. Um, Claude, we'll get our slides up. Thank you so much. And thank you to the ARC for all you do, generously hosting us all this morning. And Jeannie, I have to move into presentation mode after I'm, every time I hear Jeannie speak, I'm like, madly taking notes. It's, um, so thank you so much. You're such an amazing, powerful resource for us in um, North Virginia. So today we're going to, and I want to introduce Claude Thomas, actually. We just um, brought on a program director, and we're really excited to have her on the call today. She'll help me with the slides and in the breakout room um, later this morning. So our presentation today is creating an inclusive world, one community at a time. So Jeannie has just put a lot of energy and um, great information into telling you where you might be able to live in our community. If, if, and it looks like from the poll that a lot of families are very seriously considering that. And then we have waiver services that can kind of support your adult child um, for ADLs, activities of daily living or whatever they need to successfully live outside of the family home. What we like to think of ourselves as we are that piece of community that is that overlay that really can make um, our young adults and older adults um, very successful in these inclusive settings. Okay, next slide. All right, so our mission is to build inclusive communities and strengthen neighborhoods through diverse programming, sustainable, affordable housing and social spaces for people of all abilities. Um, and we love this mission and um, we push ourselves on this. It's, it's actually really unique, the work we're doing, I think, in affordable housing. I mean, when we look throughout the country, there have been a lot of pretty cool solutions for people that are really well resourced, but um, we're good, Claude, you can go. But we're, we're really proud of the fact that we are looking at um, the communities that are all affordable. So our why, and most of you will go through this very quickly, are very familiar with um, what you are facing, um, 7.37 million adults in the United States living with a developmental disability. Um, we And this number is changing, and I've seen numbers much bigger than 50,000 students with autism, as an example, exiting um, high school each year. We know that of that 7.37 million, um, a great number of them are autistic. And we also know that the 7.37 million is not counting everyone that um, maybe has support needs. 
Um, something that greatly alarms us is this 1.3 million people with DD who are living with a caregiver older than 60 in 2017. And a, a great academic article um, on Ratto and Mezeborn 2015 found that only 4% of autistics are living independently. And we recognize that it can be very traumatic when a parent predeceases their adult child. And that will, the reality is that it's going to happen for most of our families. And we have um, our children who are not only facing the loss of a parent, but they're, they are potentially facing the loss of a home and a loss of community. Um, and then we have 62% of our people um, with DD, our friends with DD and ID who are living in their own apartment. Okay, next slide. Right, so our approach is definitely a housing first model. Historically, we have in this country treated housing as a destination that was really predicated on an individual's readiness. So we all have, when we're looking, I was you know, looking at that poll, when we all have this list of issues or problems we think that need to be solved before our, our adult child can move out of the family home. I know when I when we went to Jeannie for our family, it was, you know, our daughter has seizures, um, she's too loud, um, she hasn't mastered her ADLs, all of these things that we saw as barriers for her kind of moving out and living her most self-determined life. So what this argue does. Um, and I'll get to Jeannie's solutions, how she helped coaches. But what this model um, argues for is prioritizing for permanent housing. And then you figure out what those supports need to be for an individual. So for our family, instead of waiting for this mastery of um, activities of daily living, which I know we're all doing, and, and I know for us, year by year went by and we weren't actually making great progress, right? I mean, we this is the goal for this year and we're gonna do it and we may or may not reach that. But um, what Jeannie kind of walked us through was, well, if noise is an issue, then accommodation could be um, your adult child needs to live on the bottom floor or they need to be closer to an exit. If folks on the call could please stay on mute. Thank you. I think I got it. All right, thanks. Um, oh, so an accommodation could be have a friend who is who has Tourette's and is quite loud. So to be a good neighbor and to live in community, we just make for systems where he is, if he needs to exit instead of walking all down the hall, at 11 o'clock at night, he can go right down the stairwell or he's right next to an elevator. So all these types of things that are pretty easy to accommodate, if you think creatively and flexibly, um, certainly we're going to talk later with our friends at Safe and Home, those Safe Home supports, all of that can make a huge difference. And what we like to think of it is a blend of families and these supports that are working together for better outcomes. Um, I won't go through all of these, but definitely um, we like all of our Properties are near public transportation. We're practicing that all the time. This past week, we had um, for each of our properties that are open and even those that are not, we have dinner clubs. Um, Roslyn Dinner Club near Queens Court is the first Wednesday of every month. And, you know, we had 30 people show up and, you know, it's fine. You can drop your child off if you can, but we're not always going to be able to. We're not maybe not going to be here to drop our child off in 15, 20 years. So whatever the family's in its situation is we need to be thinking about that sustainability piece. So we're training our friends to, you know, we had like seven people got into an Uber pool. Um, we had a, a man who's in his fifties take a bus for the first time with um, another community partner. Like it's just when we're doing this in community, in fact, it was fun when we were always problem solving, how are we going to get all these people home? And I heard one of our um, friends say, oh my gosh, this is the best part of these activities, just the time we get to talk when we're doing transportation. So making sure we're always focusing on that. Um, another great thing about affordable housing, I should say really quick, is it means that all of our properties are intergenerational. So a typical property like um, Gilliam Place, 173 units, we have eight set aside for the disability population. But that means 500 people are living here. So there are families and children and um, just an amazing energy and so many people to meet and wrap around and make community with. And we're finding that um, this has been made it possible for us to have truly inclusive um, settings. For Arlington County, I am I'm sad to report that we still do not have 
um, inclusive, we were not an inclusive school district. So our adult children did not grow up with their peers in the classroom, in the lunchroom, um, at clubs, at all of that. So it's, it's a lot, right? It's very much a fractal system. We're expecting them to become adults and just be in inclusive settings when actually the larger setting may not be familiar with what it looks like to be with someone who has autism or doesn't have complete motor control or a friend in a wheelchair. So what we're trying to do is kind of go back and make that community, make our neighbors comfortable with us, um, work together um, to really make these safe communities. And one thing we are very excited about and really committed to is the idea that when we're in a building, we really want to uplift the entire building, like to make it inclusive. It, we don't want it to only benefit um, our friends with DD. And we recognize that there are so many people that are lonely in, in our communities. And so it's really through community partnerships, like we're committed to getting everyone in the building, a library card who wants one. We've partnered with Bike Arlington, you know, the red bikes all through the city. Anyone that lives in our properties or anyone in our, our stomping ground community gets a $5 annual membership to, um, to, to borrow the bikes for a year. And that's really exciting. So then when we do an activity with them, advertised in the building, everyone in the building is invited. So everything we do ends up being inclusive. We have um, an amazing drumming circle that we do. We're doing it this summer. We've got one Sunday at one. We'd love to have you check it out. And there'll be babies there as well as grandparents. And it's just a really exciting energy. We can have as many as 50 people show up for an event like that. So really, I think just collaborative and cre creative solutions for all of our families. Um, and I have to say, as um, proof of concept, our pilot at Gillian Place has been um, wildly, wildly successful. All right, next slide, please. All right, so our method, definitely I think the most important thing to get out of the slide is that we are very focused on having our adults live um, self-determined lives and they need to be, we want them to be consumer controlled. And really, I think something that we're really trying to focus and help our families to see is to focus on support needs and not so much functionality. Like a, a family will call us and say, well, I've got a, uh, an autistic son who's really high functioning. And that may be true. They may have gone to college. They may have a job, but um, are they lonely? Do they have friends? Um, do they have community? Are they okay? Uh, alone at night. I mean, all of those things that we need to figure out. So instead of reducing everyone to what they can or cannot do, we're really trying to look at what are those supports that we can give an individual that'll make them thrive in these settings. Um, so a perfect example is natural supports. When we're in an inclusive building and we all get to know each other, then the neighbors are looking out for each other. Remote supports, again, like safe and home. Um, our friends are all, and these are services that are provided by the waiver. I, um, you know, we're not using cameras, but we are using sensors for our friends with seizures. There's tablets. Um, I won't say much more about that because we'll let Melissa touch with that later. Paid Neighbor is a pretty unique program that we've started in our first community. We were kind of overwhelmed. We just put a poster up downstairs that said, um, want to help a neighbor, $15 an hour. You know, we have a lot of friends that would make incredibly great aids. Um, they are not turned off by the $15 an hour wage, what they don't really have maybe is transportation, they may have skills, but they, um, you know, they don't really, it's hard for them to go work someplace, especially with the price of gas, you know, 90 minutes away. So we're offering, um, I'll, I'll take again my daughter as an example, she doesn't need someone sitting on the couch all day, but she may need someone to help um, just check on her to make sure she got into bed, although we can do remote supports for that, but maybe cutting up the vegetables or um, joining her and her friends for a walk. So those are the type of things we've been able to get neighbors who are in the building, a young mother who has no problem taking a 45 minute shift, all those little succinct things that your adult child may need help with. We now have neighbors in the building that may be very motivated to join in community um, and have this kind of shared living experience. And then just kind of thinking about what are these supportive amenities, um, benefits counseling, community life. Um, we just hired our first community builder. We're really excited about that. And really seeing that this life skills training in an organic setting is really allowing um, our adults to really thrive. Because instead of, you know, mom trying to teach you 
how to, you know, whatever, saute the onions. Now we're actually doing it food prep in the apartment. Um, it's really kind of hands-on, more organic, I think that way. All right, Claude, next slide. Our favorite slide. We are very excited and proud of the fact that we are offering nearly 80 hours of free programming every month. And for some of our friends, I just saw real quickly, friends that are out of the area, you know, if you come into town Sunday for the um, drumming circle, we'd love to have you. But also there's a lot of things that do happen virtually. The bingo club is um, a, he, excuse me, the book club, um, bingo. We do a lot of our things. It was kind of the lessons we learned from COVID. A lot of our friends do very well with um, virtual programming. And so we will always continue to do that. I will not deliver your um Bingo prizes, a, a local church does all the baking for us, which makes is a very exciting part of the of the evening, but um, we'll send you a gift card instead. But we try to drive out into a, we, I think I've gone as far as Leesburg. I think I'm going to bring it in a little bit more east of that. But um, um, we actually have a friend here who just won the bingo right after moving into her own apartment. So we're really, really proud of her. Yoga today at one o'clock, we have um, an instructor that does adaptive yoga. The dinner clubs are a huge hit. If you live farther west, we're going to have our first one coming up out in the Reston area. Um, coming up this summer. And um, the movie nights are a huge hit. We can have as many as 30 people. And last month we showed, um, and this is on the in the community room at Queens Court in Roslyn, just magnificent views. And we showed um, Toy Story. And so all the children in the building came and it was just the energy in the room when all the adults were cheering at the end when Woody is making his great escape. And just to have really that feeling of community is really exciting. So check out our schedule. You can sign up for our weekly email distribution and it'll give you the calendar for the week and anything that's virtual or anything you can join us for every Friday morning of the year for the last three years. We've been at Roosevelt Island. It's killing me that I'm not there right now for a community hike and um, a cleanup. That's a great place because there's always parents there that can just kind of really, your adult child can be on a walk in nature and then there's always parents there that can kind of tell you about their experience and share how it's going for their family. And also, I, I like to point out the last Sunday of every month at one o'clock, we have another family walk. As many as 50 people will show up. And again, that's a great time, just that hour walk where it's a beautiful park in Arlington, Lubber Run, near the amphitheater. And it just gives families a lot of time to really just talk to people who have kind of had this lived experience. All right, I'm watching the time, Claude, one more side. So I was very excited to see um, Jeannie giving those updates on our properties. So kind of by the end of the year, early next year, we will have six properties, 51 units. Um, Gilliam Place is, we're coming, we're on a third summer. Queens Court, a lot of our friends in Roslyn moved in um, last summer. And we're leasing up now for the Waypoint in Alexandria. We just had our first supper club with them. About 25 people showed up. We actually, the building is not yet done. It's still under construction. But we met at the apartment site and then we walked over to the apartment. They gave us a big private room and it's just an incredible experience. We're really finding that our our friends are finding each other and are just so excited about connecting. Um, the Cadence is the newest property that we kind of added to our portfolio. And then the Ovation at Arrowbrook out in Herndon. And you may have noticed, I just want to point out real quick, one of the properties that Ginny listed was the Terwilliger, which is actually not under the our stomping ground umbrella. But we really... This, our community, the work we're doing is open to everyone. So even, you know, we have families that are making decisions to live near one of these properties. Like we are never going to be the housing solution for everyone. You know, I mean, there's wait lists, there's, um, we're having an affordable housing crisis, but we also are encouraging families to think strategically and creatively about where could you possibly be that would be close to what's going on with what we're doing. Okay, next slide. And one thing I'll just mention real quickly, we are very excited about is really recognizing there is a complete paucity of data on outcomes for um, adults that have moved out of institutions or moved out of the family home. So we are really excited. We are working on this right now with funding from our partners at Melwood and George Washington University. We are um, getting ready to hopefully start taking data this month. We really want to be able to demonstrate for um, our philanthropic funders and for the state and for um, 
actually the federal government to recognize that we we can have better outcomes when people are living in community with these kind of supports. So we're, we're going to take a deep dive into um, kind of get baseline data on individuals before they move out of the family home. Um, are you employed? Do you have friends? Um, how is your mental health status? Um, kind of looking at everything and then seeing how being involved with the work we're doing um, may improve these health outcomes. So we're really excited about that. We'll have that recruitment flyer out soon and we're super excited about having our friends join us. So join the Our Stomping Ground community and you can be part of that comparison group if you have not yet moved out. Okay, um, just, you know, we're around, we're in touch. I just want to say that um, real quickly that our community events are really for everyone. And we really are trying to help adults and um, their families find their community. We, we recognize that um, while this is all very exciting, not everybody does need to, to move in. But we thank you and, and want to encourage you to find your community wherever you live, Virginia Beach. I mean, who are you taking with you on this journey? Our family would never have had the confidence to move our daughter um, out of the family home and into one of these properties if we hadn't been able to talk other families into going with us. So really just want to acknowledge that change is hard, but we are going to move forward together. All right. Thanks, Ashley. That's it for us. Thank you so much, Donna. That was a great presentation. And it really struck me uh, talking about community and that old adage, it takes a village. Um, so next, I will turn it over to Melissa Blackburn. Melissa is with Safe and Home. Um, so Melissa, I'll go ahead and share your slides and just let me know whenever you want to move to the next one. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, like she said, my name is Melissa Blackburn. I'm with Safe and Home. And thank you for inviting us here. And thank you to Jeannie and Donna for the wonderful information that we learned. If you have your phone handy, you're more than welcome to scan the QR code and that would take you to our website. With Safe and Home, we are a remote support service. We um, here in Virginia are known as electronic home-based supports. We provide supports throughout the entire state as well as other uh, states within the country. Next slide, please. We're going to play a video. This video explains how everything works together. And sometimes it's always easier to understand when you can see visual representation. And then we'll go into details. If you don't mind, press and play, please, Ashley. Let's see, does it just click? And there is sure. a link in the there is a link in the notes. Ah, uh, okay. Let me go ahead and follow that one. It will not let me click on the link. Sorry about that. Melissa, I apologize. It's not letting that, me click the link. It's that's okay. Well, it will be in the in the slides that uh, is sent to everyone. This is uh, Chris who is living independently, using remote supports using the tablet as well as the geocom and if he goes on a community walk he may he, in the video he takes a wrong turn and can press the button and speak to remote staff who can locate his coordinates exact coordinates and help him guide him back home and i will send um we can put that will be in the um handouts with the video. Um, next slide, please. So Safe and Home is a person-centered support service that empowers the individual with disabilities to live their fullest, most self-determined lives by providing supports when they need it, combined with the technology to re reach their goals. We are not in a person's home, 
We are using sensors that Donna mentioned earlier, not cameras. Uh, we can have cameras at the front door for an individual to know if it's safe to open the door. But think of us as a direct support professional, but on demand. We're not in the home. We are always available 24-7, 365, and we are always supportive, never directive. We are covered 100% by Medicaid waivers, the ID and DD waivers, the FIS, CL, and the BI waiver, as well as CCC plus waiver. If you can move to the next slide, please. Independence looks different for everybody. It does not necessarily mean the individual has to be living on their own. They could be living with their family, they could be living with a roommate, or they could be living on their own. Next slide, please. This shows how it works. There are sensors placed throughout the home. With the assistive technology, there could be sensors, there could be in the bed, there could be a bed sensor. They're all interconnected and can alert remote support staff if a person were to fall, have a seizure, or um, notify the next person in their care circle. Next slide, please. Some of the solutions we can um, help mitigate medication management. There is a pill dispenser that the individual can learn how to take their medication on their own. And it could be coupled with remote supports with either the use of a cell phone, tablet, or the geocomp. We can provide supports for overnight support, visitor safety, wandering, kitchen safety, seizure management, emotional regulation, youth transition, and after-school work support. Uh, something with kitchen safety, we have stove sensors, and after, uh, coupled with a sensor in the kitchen, after a certain amount of time that the person, had, there's no motion detected, it will automatically turn off the stove or the oven. Um, with seizure management, there is a seizure wristband that the person can wear, just a little watch, very tiny, that will not only alert the care team when a person is having a seizure, but it also records it. So you can take that data back to the neurologist. And next slide, please. These are the five elements of remote support service. As you can see, the individual is in the center. We are person-centered. So what the solutions that the individual may need, what supports that they need in order to live as independently as possible. And like I said earlier, independence could be something different. Donna mentioned certain things with ADLs. Now we are not physically in the home, but we can check in and just ask, hey, did you get a chance to take your medication? Well, what did you, did you eat a snack? What did you eat? Was it good? Et cetera. And where you have that human to human connection, we are not prompting people to do X, Y, Z. We're having conversations. We use the sensor technology. Like I said, activity, temperature, moisture, doors, windows, stove, and bed. And we can see patterns. So anytime there is something outside of the norm, we remote supports or the care circle will be alerted. And again, whoever the individual and or their family designate. At each week, we provide weekly support or weekly reports. And you can see the assistive technology in the, in the, on the slide. There's the tablet, the seizure wristband is to the right the ring doorbell, and then the geocom. And they're all tied in together to provide the support for the individual. Next slide, please. And this just ties it in together. We are one piece to the puzzle with in-home with in supports, community supports, advocacy groups, natural supports, housing and work supports, we're all here to provide supports to the individual. 
And this is a lifelong journey. Next slide, please. I am um, just going to highlight some successful stories. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time so we don't go over. Next slide, please. Meet Lucy, her desired outcomes. She wants to feel safe and secure in her home and community. She wants to live alone with her dog, Leon, know when she has support when she needs it. She's diagnosed with a mild intellectual disability and sometimes is forgetful. She lives in a gated apartment community in Fairfax. And on occasion, she forgets her gate code and is locked out. And she is happiest when people call her and visit her. With the supports of inclusion consultants, they helped her secure an, an apartment. They found her a day program and other favorite activities. And she uses remote supports for emergencies or when she's accidentally locked out and receives daily friendly calls for check-ins. She has assistive technology for emergency alerts. Next slide. Deborah takes her medication independently. She wants to take her medication independently. She remembers to eat in the morning with her med medication. Some of her desired outcomes also are to stay safe during community outings and identify possible reasons for excessive fatigue uh, mid-afternoon. She lives in a cluster apartment setting in the city center of Alexandria. She has a roommate and who provides overnight supports and she has breakthrough seizures. So a solution, our friends at, stomping, at our stomping ground, she lives in the apartment complex. She receives remote supports at, for medication reminders scheduled three times a day. The cluster apartments share day support personnel and circle of supports provide group outings activities. So we can address some of her desired outcomes and to ensure that she's safe and independent and is living her most self-determined life. Next slide, please. Jack, some of his desired outcomes outcomes include to ensure he gets to work and from work safely, avoid unnecessary calls from his parents to ensure he is on track for the day, increases his sleep at night. About Jack, he lives in a, alone in a high-rise apartment building in Arlington. He recently moved out of his parents' home. He loves his job, but sometimes sleeps in, missing his Uber, or forgets to clock in at work. With the supports, the ARC identified the supports most beneficial to his goals. DARS helped him secure a job within a few miles from his new apartment. He uses assistive technology to notify his parents that, that he's left on time and arrived at work on time. Um, in the video that I encourage everyone to go to our YouTube channel, you'll see the device. It's called the Geocom. And with a push of button, he can notify remote supports, or you can text that number and receive exact GPS coordinates that will pull up onto your Google Maps. He is a behavioral therapist, uh, reviews the AT reports for nighttime activity and remote supports to remind him to clock in at work and turn off electronics at night. So with the use of remote supports, not only can we provide supports in the home and in the community, but also at work. Next slide, please. Next slide, please where our last slide has all the contacts in the entire state. I was reading the chats earlier and I noticed that there are some individuals in the Virginia Beach area. We are all over the state of Virginia. You can contact uh, an account executive within your state and it has my contact information as well as our district manager. And if anyone is outside of the state in D.C. or Maryland, uh, feel free to contact me and I can 
um, help you reach the appropriate person. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melissa. Really awesome. So what we want to do now is have about 20 minutes ago um, left. Um, frozen. My, my internet is a little bit wonky this morning. Hopefully I'm back just because I was frozen. So we have about 20 minutes time left. So what I want to do is have um, just a break room. So we're probably going to do four breakout rooms. Um, I hope that this is uh, led by participants. So each of the panelists, myself, we will all be in one of the breakout rooms with you. But we want you all to leave. back you're back oh, okay we're back <laughs> one out for second all right i apologize to everyone um so we'll break out into some breakout rooms it, during that time if you all could come up with maybe your top two or three questions and i did see of course questions in the chat so we'll try to get those as well um because we're a little bit short on time i think we're only going to spend maybe five minutes or so in a breakout room so um, just enough time to kind of chat, come up with some questions. Um, and let's see, Ra, can we go ahead and assign people? We'll assign automatically. Do you want to do, let's see, I think I can do it here. Four breakout rooms. Let's see. So if no one's, if you all haven't done this before, you'll see a message pop up that says join breakout room. So click that, join the breakout room. And then after about five minutes or so, we'll bring everyone back together into the main room. So don't leave yet. Okay, I'm sorry, are we doing assign automatically or assign manually? Let's just, I already got it pulled up. Let's just do oh, okay. assign automatically. Um, I've got four breakout rooms here, so I'm going to go ahead and open all the rooms. I'm going to stop clicking things before I get us in trouble. Right. Um, all right. So once you see that message, go ahead and join the room.
All right, we'll give folks time to leave their breakout rooms. All right, hopefully everyone had a good discussion. I know that was a short amount of time, but hopefully you were able to engage with other people and ask some good questions. So what I'd like to do um, is ask um, folks if for, for whichever room you were in, if someone could speak up and, and um, let me know kind of what your top questions are, and then we can go around with the panelists um, to, to help answer those questions. So just um, go ahead and unmute and ask away. Or you can raise your hand. Do you wanna do you want us to go through the ones that people have typed to us first? Or um, I guess if you've typed a question, feel free to also raise your hand if you want to verbally ask that. Um, if not, if no one raised their hand, we can go through the questions that are typed in the chat. How did the discussions go? I, I was trying to kind of pop into a Oh, we frozen. <laughs> it was good. Um, in our group, um, we had um, a parent ask a question about specifically um, for their situation with their child. So, okay. Nicole, I saw you raise your hand. Do you want to go ahead and? Um, yeah, I had a quick question. It was recommended that I um, actually address it to Jeannie. Um, for people who are interested in possibly buying an investment property and with the goal of it becoming a group home. Um, I'm not sure if like what you would do, like what would the, be the process to do something like that if we were thinking of that. Are you asking about buying an investment property to make it into a licensed group home that yes. gets funded by waiver? Yes. <clears throat> then um, uh, I, I would actually redirect that question <laughs> to one of our community resource consultants at, at our, uh, Department of Behavioral Health, um, okay. they they are going to be able to walk you through the whole process of licensure. At this point, I would, but what I would mention is, is that it's really important to understand the context in which you're doing this. And that is that there are fewer and fewer and fewer uh, waiver slots that are funding community living waivers, which are the only waiver that, that will support a group home. Um, and there are, in some areas of the state, a glut of group home providers. So oh. uh, it's really important to understand the dynamics that you're going into because you don't want to, uh, uh, it, well, first of all, and you need to understand whether you want to become a service provider <laughs> or if you're talking about buying a home and partnering with a service provider that already exists and you just lease the home to that service provider. And again, that service provider is going to be thinking about the same things. Yeah. You know, am I, do I have empty beds now that I can't fill because there aren't enough waiver slots or, you know, or we've got too many providers in this area. So they're going to do that whole business analysis before they're going to, they, before either, I would suggest that that happens before either you or they jump into that kind of arrangement. Can you say off the top, like what areas where there's a glut in group homes right now? Um, Chesterfield, uh, I, I, I. That's, about, that's the one that I have heard of most recently. I, I couldn't really give you more accurate information, but our community resource consultants probably could. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mark, I see your hand uh, raised as well. Yeah, we had a, um, one of the questions that came up in our area was um, with an individual who's a 22 year old um, with uh, high functioning autism and he doesn't want to accept support or accept, you know, help, uh, and is resistant to working with um, people in the in um, you know service providers uh, and people who who could provide assistance. Um, the one thing I suggested was that maybe participating in some things like the um, 
uh, the dinners from our stomping ground might be able to meet with some peers uh, and that might provide him with some encouragement of seeing some of the advantages of cooperating. Uh, that was my suggestion, but I'll open that up to see if other people have uh, better suggestions than that. Donna or Melissa, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I love that suggestion. You know, I mean, whenever, like, again, a family says, oh, our child is so high functioning. Well, how high functioning are you if you don't have friends and you're living in your parents' basement? So that's not necessarily something you're going to say back to that adult child, but we have to make that community, right? I mean, that for everyone to live their safest, I think, most self-determined lives, we are all social beings. And although historically we have not thought of our autistic friends as social, we are all social beings. We know that. So I think, you know, we've had friends that are really hesitant, like they come into a room and we've had friends that for months, Claude will tell me this, that they're sitting at a table by themselves. And, you know, in four months, they're no longer sitting at a table by themselves. And they choose to sit there or they'll bring a book to the event. So it's really, we have to practice these inclusive settings, which a lot of our adult children have never been exposed to in their entire lives. So we just, you know, join the party. I mean, it, again, every time we go to one of these events, I am just, I can barely sleep at night. I am so excited about the progress that everyone is making in these community inclusive settings. Hey, Donna, can I add something to that? Because I think the other piece of this is, is also sort of experiencing one step removed, what supports are like, right? So, so if an individual is is you know not not really willing to accept supports right now, but they start hanging around with people who are getting supports, and and they start understanding what support really look can look like and mean. They may become a little bit less resistant to it, um, especially if they become really good friends with an individual who's willing to sort of share what the ups and downs and you know good and bad are of having a support provider. So I I, I definitely think that that's a great place to start. No, absolutely. Yes. And I think these community walks have been kind of game changers. We have a friend who works, he drives his own car, he is, and he's not in a set aside apartment, but he's chosen to live in one of these communities. And, you know, he originally thought, you know, he's spent his entire life trying to pass as neurotypical. And, you know, he was on the walk last night, kind of asking for dating advice. Like he never had a place to go before. So I think finding those spaces where we can really kind of self actualize is so important for our friends. Sorry, Melissa, I interrupted you. Oh, no, you're completely fine. I just wanted to add too, we are just a layer of the puzzle and we are providing supports kind of in the background if you want to, and the individual can choose if they want to participate with us or not. So I, I would agree that being having your adult child interacting with others, developing those natural supports that don't always have to be mom and dad and those true friendships, because as we, as we age, we evolve and we learn from our peers and certain situations where he has maybe been in the past resistant for support, maybe because he was told you have to do X, Y, Z. And we're not here to tell people what to do. We're here in the background. We're here when you need, need help. Right. Uh, I see one more hand raised, Eileen. Eileen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. I apologize, but go ahead with your question. This is Eileen Lehner. Um, my question is, in another state, not in Virginia, there are a group of parents, and I've heard this in other places as well, that seem to think that um, segregated or enclave community, separate community housing is the safest. And um, you know, I'm hearing about all of your programs and so many of them are inclusive housing. And I, I believe that the safest is to live in the fishbowl of our community where everybody's eyes are on you. But I don't know if there's information that supports that perspective. Um, and I'm really looking to find some because uh, many parents' knee-jerk reaction for adults with developmental disabilities is, oh, they're going to be unsafe out in the community and we need to put them behind gates in a segregated community where other people can't get them so that they're safe. And that I know is kind of antithetical to inclusion. So I'm wondering if anybody has any suggestions or 
direction for information that I could use in this discussion. We're working on the data piece and there is a great group, a new group in Tyson's Corner. Um, I can, I'll look up their, their contact and put it in the, um, Claude, if you can help me to put that in the chat, but they're really trying to get all data surrounding all of this and certainly the study we're doing, but you are correct. There is not much data. What we encourage families to do is just kind of observe the lived experience, you know, come to one. We give tours all the time. We are happy to have you come look and talk directly to young adults that are living in community, people with really kind of intense support needs who are thriving. And I really think this proof of concept, that's what we're trying to do here, really in the state and nationally is let people see um, what this looks like. You kind of have to see it to believe it. Um, that sounds trite, but I really don't know. I mean, it is the best thing for a family to see and just be part of this community. Even if you don't live near, you know, make a day trip, come a day, we've got a lot of things going on. But um, I think that is really, <laughs> the best way to kind of see what's going on. Talk to people that are already living in community like this. You know, I do, I should say a plug for the ARC of Virginia for their, um, their state conference in August. I think that is now their, that is what they're doing. That is the topic of discussion for that couple of days. That first week in August is going to be inclusive housing. And they're going to be um, people from all over the state sharing. They've got an amazing keynote speaker. It's really people coming together to kind of demonstrate, talk about their successes. Um, it's just going to be a great experience. So if you want to make the trip to Virginia Beach, our stomping ground is going to be part of that panel that first day. And we're really super excited to be part of that discussion. So yeah, see if, um, and I think there's a virtual option. One of our art friends can answer yeah. that. Yep, there sure is. Okay, great, thanks. Great, I see two more hands raised. I also wanna to get to a couple questions in the chat. So we might go over time. Um, so if you're able to stay with us, great. If not, totally understand this recorded. You will also receive all of these slides um, and contact information for our panelists. So, um, Anne, I see your hand up. Anne, you're, you're muted. I was wondering. You're not able to. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I I, I was wondering um, what the costs are of of some of these um, services. Um, I mean, if you if you do get state support, what what um, would be the range of 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 cost that that um, the individual would have to provide? Is there, uh, do you have some examples of what that might be for our stomping ground or safe and home? Well, I can speak for safe and home. The cost would be 100% covered by the waiver. The individual does not have to pay a dime and it's used through the waiver. There is a limit for assistive technology and electronic home-based supports. They are up to $5,000 annually for the technology that's used in the home that's installed in the house, as well as the geocom or the tablet, the individual and their support coordinator monitors this. They have up to $5,000 annually in the budget. Then for remote supports, the individual has up to $5,000 annually in their budget and it's covered at 100% through the waiver. Now, there are some individuals that we support that elect or their families have elected to do private pay that they may be on a wait list for the um, waivers, but it's a very minimal cost and it depends on what services, what supports, and what devices that they are using. How, how many um, clients do you have where um, 
hundred percent of the cost is paid by the waiver? I do. Um, we have, I, I don't have current data. The last information that I had received that there are over 400 individuals in service throughout the state of Virginia. And there's only a maybe two or three at the max that will pay privately. Everybody else is 100% covered by the waiver. So for electronic home-based supports, the remote supports, the individual must be over the age of 18 and it's covered by their waivers. Or if they have a waiver through, no, EHBS is not provided through the MCOs, the CCC plus waiver, but the technology can be used. Thank you. You're welcome. Rob, did you have a question? Um, in our room, it's actually came up with uh, more than one person um, talking about a client who was um, um, does not covered uh, by the DD waiver. Um, were, um, I think we're 25 um, when they became disabled. And they were just wanting to know what kind of options we have uh, for clients like that who are older um, when they're diagnosed or when they're identified. Yeah, I think I saw that question in the chat. Um, resources for people who became disabled after age 22 uh, and is not DD waiver eligible. Um, Jeannie, do you have any uh, information on that? Well, that's, that's really a very individualized conversation <laughs> because I, we would need to know a lot of information about that person's income, um, you know, what, what their, their current situation is, uh, you know, what supports they're going to need. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, housing, housing subsidy, for example, it, it's, it's going to also depend on where they live or where they want to live. Um, um, and it's likely going to involve getting on housing wait lists, housing subsidy wait lists, because really um, for it, it, folks who are not in this target population, there are very, very long wait lists for housing assistance. Um, you can, you know, the housing choice voucher, which is probably the most well-known, it used to be called section eight, um, uh, has wait lists uh, in most jurisdictions or you know, cities and counties throughout Virginia, um, with the exception of some very, very rural ones, <laughs> which you know, can sometimes present its own set of issues. So again, it would probably be a, a very individual conversation. I'm happy to have that with people. I can't guarantee I'm going to give you the magic bullet because I probably won't, but I can at least sort of point you in some directions based on the individual circumstances. Thank you. Was that the only question, Rob? Um, yeah, well, someone else was asking how far in advance uh, do we need to start looking at options to get on waiting lists and whatnot. They were, I think they were looking at maybe like six years out. Um, it, in terms of getting on wait lists for like rent subsidy or, or the waiver or... And if, if that was your question, whoever's on the call, if you want to pipe up, if you have... Um... Oh, there it is, for housing options, yeah. There we go, yeah. So, okay, yeah, so, so, you know, getting on a wait list six years out is probably not going to serve you very well because the person's circumstances are probably going to change enough in six years, both financially and support-wise and things like that, that it's not worth it. I would say, you know, you probably don't want to do this. You probably want to get on a... Uh, start approaching a support coordinator about doing a referral for housing if you're about a year out. That makes that will make more sense. Um, now, be advised again that you can do that and, and that doesn't mean that there's going to be a resource ready and waiting for you. <laughs> uh, depends on the jurisdiction that you're in, uh, but, but we would certainly start that conversation and try to position the person so that they're ready to take advantage of a resource that may become available. As, as a parent who's going through all of this, I would say if you're not on the Medicaid waiver wait list, you need to get on that as soon as possible. Um, as it comes to the housing, I think what you're doing right now of participating in programs like this and being aware of what's out there and what you're going to want to use and how you position yourself is something you want to do. One of the things is that all of these programs are evolving and changing and legislation is affecting it and everything else. So 
what is true today, the, 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 the environment might be completely different six years from now. There might be all new waivers, all the waivers that we're talking about may not exist six years from now. Uh, it can, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic situation. So continuing to participate in programs like this to be aware of what's out there is probably the best thing you can be doing right now. Um, and Judy, you may know the answer to this, but in terms of how um, like funding is decided and, and things like that, how much of it, it happens on a state level versus a local, like county by county level in terms of slots and funding and all that kind of... For, 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 for programs like our state rental assistance program? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the, the decisions about... Um, uh, so, so the way that this program works <laughs> is that the state receives funding, you know, for, in the governor's budget, which is hopefully blessed by the General Assembly and so far so good. <laughs> um, we then partner with local housing agencies that administer the rental assistance. So the first trick is to have a local housing agency that's willing to administer the rental assistance program. First, well, the first trick is having the money. Second trick is having the, having the, uh, the local partner that's willing to administer the program for you. Um, and then the third trick is, is frankly that, that local partner's capacity. Because at this point, um, you know, we have local partners that we have joined with to be able to make this rental assistance available. But as you know, I'm sure you all have figured out in our current economy, we've got some pretty severe staffing issues for, I mean, and that's hitting everything. It's hitting direct services, it's hitting rental properties and their leasing staff, and it's hitting our housing providers as well. So that is sometimes limiting, even if we have the money available, their ability to take on more uh, uh, folks and pr pr provide more assistance. So those, you know, those are sort of the dynamics that we're working with. But if, if, if the aim is to try to get more resource available, it's, yeah, it's gonna depend on which locality you're in. Ultimately, the aim is to ask, you know, for that funding through the, the General Assembly, through state legislatures and uh, uh, that approach. That's what funds the program it's in its entirety across the state. However, if the issue is not that, not the money, but it's the local capacity to administer, then those conversations may have to happen with, you know, the folks who are administering that and the, the uh, local housing comp uh, housing uh, agencies um, that are staffed by, for example, the the you know a, a city or a county. Great, thank you. Well, I think um, that will wrap us up. Unless anyone has um, another question, um, I think that answered most questions that I see in the chat. Um, and if it didn't, I apologize. Um, you can always, like I said, reach out to to our panelists. Um, like I said, um, contact information will be provided and the slides will be provided so you can find out more information that way. Um, but thank you all so much, Donna, Claude, Melissa, Jeannie. Thank you so much for your time this morning, your knowledge and sharing all of that with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. You do it, thanks. Thank you. Have a great morning, everyone. Great, right, thanks. Thanks, bye-bye.